Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space uh, Conference and Symposium in National Harbor, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. And it is an absolute honor to run into my old friend, uh, Admiral Sir George Zambellis, uh, the former uh, first Sea Lord of the Royal Navy, uh, which is got to be the world's best title that you had. Now you're uh, advising uh, companies. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Vago, it's great to be here. Um, you, I, you know, one of the things that you focused on was innovation when you were first Sea Lord. Uh, now you're advising companies. One of them is, is Liquid Robotics, uh, but but four or five other companies on, at, a, at a senior level. And I wanted to ask you about maritime innovation and how this space is dramatically changing, dramatically changing because of computing power and a number of other factors. Well, I think we're on the head of a, the end of a revolution. Um, three parts to it, really: massively increased computing speed. Uh, massively increased data management, and then the bringing together of those threads into a new understanding of the battle space, particularly the underwater domain. What are, like, for example, the, the U.S. Navy uh, is is looking at its, you know, ocean task forces, digital ocean. You know, what does that mean from the standpoint of a warfighter? Because you know, that's what you spent the vast majority of your career doing is as a warfighter. How does this change the game? It's all about understanding. So in the old days, we would say it's a very expensive domain, the underwater domain to dominate. Now I think through technology and innovation, we're going to reduce the costs of the understanding of the underwater domain through small and innovative companies sharing data. And that's why the uh, advent of the Unmanned Warrior series and then Information Warrior this year is all about reshaping the opportunity space for the use of data underwater. But you know, every single advantage that we tend to leverage, potential adversaries tend to leverage as well, right? The third offset strategy very much in the US was driven by this idea that the very benefits that we can reap from it, potential adversaries came. What are, what are the puts and takes on that dynamic? Yeah, that's a great question. Because I think we're in a more difficult position we in the West are in a more difficult position than those nations that have an autocratic approach to technology and military innovation. Because we have to make companies work together. We have to leverage resources to make uh, these innovations work. Whereas they, of course, can just lead in a different sort of way with a greater focus. So I think that puts an imperative on the West to be much more aggressive about how it makes the most use of innovation. Where do you think the specific, without being company specific at, at, at all, of course, you know, UK is always, and in fact, the UK pavilion is called the Innovation Pavilion um, here at the show. And, and UK industry has always prided itself on, you know, having some of these, you know, smaller companies, but making these sort of leap ahead, uh, uh, you know, these leaps ahead. Same thing also with some small manufacturers and smaller companies, obviously, Liquid Robotics being another example of it. But where do you see the specific pockets where you're going to see, we're going to see some of the biggest changes as you look at each one of these individual slices, for example, of that undersea domain awareness, for example. Yeah. So really what you're asking me is how the mechanics of opportunity are going to be unlocked. And I think that's one of the hardest nuts to crack. And the reason why it's hard to crack is fundamentally we have to get a collaboration between the customer and its requirement set and industry and its offering. And both parties have got reasons for doing what they've always done. Both parties can afford to take less imaginative steps and be less creative. So this innovation journey isn't just about technology as I described earlier, it's actually about bringing together the opportunity and that's really tough. And the way out of that is leadership. It's, it's got a really tough leadership to force a marriage of convenience between the technical opportunity and the, and the country or country's national requirements for security. Anytime the budget gets tight, there's this tendency to want to raid the R&D accounts. And that was one of the things that the Obama administration at least tried to protect somewhat, even when there was budget pressure, to make sure that that seed corn for the future existed. That's what drove former Secretary Carter very, very hard. From a UK perspective, there are some questions that the UK historically has not been spending from an MOD perspective a defense ministry perspective as much on that sort of basic research and development as it should. Has that turned around in the UK as far as you're concerned? No. I, I think we still need to spend more on R&D. I think we need to spend more on encouraging innovation. And I think we need to be much more aggressive in our demand of the opportunity, either nationally or internationally. But the real trick, I think, is slightly bigger than that, if I may be so bold. If you think about how governments measure performance, they tend to measure in large chunks of equipment, ships, submarines, tanks, aircraft. It's the classic political measure of authority. It's what appears in the newspaper as a list to compare nations' authority. So what we need to do is start to unravel some of that uh, binary 
uh, perspective and to bring out the subtleties of the evolving market that innovation gives us. We've got to allow innovation to breathe in that space and that needs political courage and industrial courage. How much do you think, from, from your perspective, the MOD ought to be investing on an annual basis because obviously huge steps were made in the Cameron government in that direction to try to increase that base R&D. It did become a priority. But how much of a percentage or, or a figure needs to be devoted you know, as the government looks forward to a very, very challenging future Brexit. I want to get your views on that in a minute. But it, you know, it is a challenging financial dynamic that the UK is going into. How much money is enough as far as you're concerned? Well, I think uh, it's a matter of public record that all of the UK ministries are under severe pressure. Um, and uh, defence is no different. And what you've got to remember is there's a 2020 general election coming up, if not earlier, and that election will be a test of the public's confidence, uh, not just in the journey towards Brexit, but actually towards economic security for the nation in this very uncertain time of the post-Brexit decision. That means that individual departments are going to be under great pressure. And if you were running a government, you would put your emphasis on health and welfare, and you would be tempted as this government is, to keep the pressure on defence, when actually defence is the first, first responsibility of government. Let me take you to um, uh, Brexit very briefly. Um, obviously, you know, the decision was made. Uh, Prime Minister May has, has already given the Article 50 uh, trigger. That starts the negotiations. Uh, obviously, Donald Tusk uh, has, has said that EU already misses uh, the UK. From your standpoint, there are some who say that, look, this could be potentially very devastating for UK defence. Pound has dropped. Uh, cost of purchasing a lot of very high-end equipment, which the UK does from the United States, all of it has become more expensive. Uh, and, and then there are concerns about, you know, what sort of border penalties there might be, whether Ireland, the thought of another vote, for example, in Scotland. Uh, you know, I have some Scottish friends who've said, you know, I would have voted leave uh, had I known that we were going to be uh, leaving, the, the UK was going to be leaving EU. Uh, and then Gibraltar, of course, one of, one of sort of the staple bases, that becomes a challenge as well. From your standpoint, you know, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities as the UK goes into, into, this, into, into this sort of uncharted territory? I think that um, it's going to be too easy to judge too quickly. And when nations make great decisions, as we have just made, then this is a long journey which requires phenomenal strategic leadership to achieve the sort of effects that are required over the next 20, 25 years. I have no doubt in the short term we've got some very tricky issues to resolve and that's the government's business today. But at the same time, the post-Brexit world is one which is wholly aligned to what Great Britain is. It's a global nation with a global history and global responsibilities. And Brexit, of course, which is defined by the character and the relationship with Europe, is just part of the story. The other half of the story is unlocking the rest of our national responsibility as in, res in respect to the rest of the world. And the Royal Navy, uh, and indeed UK Armed Forces, have a phenomenal opportunity, I think, to play a supporting role in the interna international journey that the UK is now going to take. And what do you think that role should be and will be? Well, obviously, from a maritime perspective, I think it's supporting commerce, uh, diplomacy, uh, our strategic security interests in partnership with our allies and friends around the world. And all of that falls naturally into the global opportunity which a post-Brexit world uh, points us towards. But that requires the leadership to deliver it. It requires the resources to make it happen. And that's part of the complex short-term and long-term journey we're now on. Sir, thanks so very much, Sir George. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Cheers. Thank you. You're welcome.